I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Chris Sistrunk. So Chris is a newly minted principal consultant at Mandiant. Um, thank you, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, he'll be talking about digital forensics and incident response for PLCs and other embedded devices. All right, Chris, the floor's yours. All right, thanks, Rob. Well, glad you're here. Um, I know everybody's uh, getting sleepy after lunch, so I'll try to keep this entertaining. Uh, this is uh, entitled, What's the Difference for ICS? I'm trying to make that the best pun of the conference, uh, so hopefully you enjoy that. Um, my co-presenter wasn't able to be here today because he got caught up in a uh, flight cancellation. So Josh Triplett also was important in this research and this, uh, this effort. So we're going to talk about digital forensics and incident response in general. Um, as engineer, we might call it root cause analysis. You know, after, you know, I, I had to do that when I was at the power company. Like when the Super Bowl has a power outage, uh, you get phone calls, and then you have to figure out what happened. Um, I worked at that power company. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, digital forensics for ICS. So that's not really talked about a whole lot. Some of you in here know about it and can do it. Uh, very technical folks, especially uh, some of you who do a lot of this deep research with embedded devices. Um, you know, what do you collect? What do you analyze? And then I'm going to go over some examples uh, of two devices. It's kind of a little preview of what we're going to cover in our class on Friday as well. A little overview. <coughs> um, uh, you know, instant response, you're right. Uh, something happened, something's on fire, you got to go put it out. Well, first thing you do is you, you have to assess the situation. See what's happening, what is the damage. Uh, you do triage, you got to figure out, just like, you know, emergency response crews like fire or, you know, health, if you have a heart attack, uh, what, do, what do we do? We got to define objectives, try to stop the bleeding, you know, collect evidence from the devices uh, themselves. And in this specific instance, uh, later in the talk, we're going to be talking about just the control system devices, but we also know, know DFIR from uh, doing you know, Windows and Linux and other popular operating systems as well. Do the analysis. So if you're doing memory analysis and, or you just file changes, anything that could be changed. Communicate what happened on a regular basis to the key stakeholders, um, you know, up to upper management even, and then have a remediation plan. What are we going to do if there's an active intruder? What are we going to do to kick them out and, you know, make sure that they don't come back? And then you've got to document what happened so you'll have a good, uh, you know, use case. If it ever happens again, you know what to do. So uh, if you take, if you take uh, collect, and analyze, that's the uh, digital forensics part of that. So you're going to collect data files, operating system, like volatile and non-volatile memory, uh, network traffic, applications, anything that can be um, in a in, in a operating system, any computer, any, it doesn't matter if it's a modern computer or a, a ancient computer like what we deal with, um, <laughs> uh, anything that we can look at digitally. And there are very interesting things that we can learn about uh, what we collect and then compare that to what is known good and what we designed the system to be. Doing the examination and analysis and reporting. If, has anybody ever read the Instant Response book? Um, okay. If you haven't, and if you are interested in doing digital forensics and instant response, this is an excellent book. Uh, a lot of the things that are talked about in that book apply can apply to control systems, um, even on the uh, you know HMI side. Um, this and also NIST SP hundred uh, eight hundred series dash eighty six. Uh, these are really great resources if you want to learn more about general DFIR. And in traditional DFIR with you know Windows and Linux and whatnot, you have a good set of tools. It, Mandiant, we wrote uh, Redline. It's been an industry standards free tool to do Windows analysis. Uh, also, there's an open source tool called Volatility. Excellent. I mean, it's easy. Even an eng electrical engineer, a skate engineer can do it. I, uh, last year, they, uh, Rob Lee had a 
SANS ICS challenge where you had to use redliner volatility to look at memory, and I was able to do it, and uh, that was pretty fun. Um, but it was just because those tools are so uh, well kept up to date and have a lot of features. There's a lot of websites like Malware and Vi Virus Total where people do you know, sandbox analysis of strange binaries that they find or malware or whatnot. There's cheat sheets like the SANS DFIR cheat sheet that shows you how to do digital forensics and obviously books like the one I mentioned. But what's the difference for control systems? You know, we don't have all that stuff. So let's break down the uh, that list of instant response uh, things that we want to do, and, and see if it applies to um, you know control systems and how it applies. So assessing the situation, doing the triage, that's pretty similar. It's not going to be any change. It's going to be similar to your um, disaster recovery plan for your control system that you probably have in case of a fire or any other kind of safety related. A lot of the things are going to apply here. When you define your objectives, that's a little different. You have physical uh, processes that, you know, you can't just return ICS uh, in the, the way, same way you do an IT system. You have to make sure it's done quickly and safely because uptime is important. You make a lot of money in your industrial processes, and also safety is critical. You don't want to get anyone hurt. When you collect your evidence, uh, that's also that's something that's different from re regular IT. Uh, you have real-time operating systems where there's no tools, and you have strange protocols that IT folks don't understand. They don't know the control system protocol. So uh, you really have to do a lot of manual collection. Same thing with the analysis. Um, you have to have someone who knows how the ICS was designed to, to know what's normal and what's not normal. And that is really important. There's really no ICS-specific DFIR tools that uh, that we know of until this week. We're going to be talking. I'm going to talk later about uh, the tool that Josh wrote. Um, it's going to be hopefully the first of multiple tools. I'm trying to get you guys interested in uh, contributing to that. It's going to be really excellent. <coughs> uh, communication, obviously, that's going to be similar. And remediation plan, uh, that might be. A little different as well because you can't just re-image a PLC. <laughs> That's what they do with you know you have a, a config for on XP uh, on you know that they might just re-image that machine and the control system they're going to take a new one and put it back in you know place. Uh, they have to completely replace the system in some some cases if you know if that's even possible. Um, th so you've got those constraints. And then the last thing, document, uh, obviously that's the s uh, same. <coughs> so an you, ha you have an anomaly that has occurred. Uh, so you, know, you might be, let's talk about what you would be as a, if you were an analyst sitting in a SOC for a control system. Yeah, well, there's probably not many of those. I know some of you work in control system SOCs. Uh, there's very few of us. But let's say an anomaly has occurred. You have strange network activity, uh, strange behavior. Now, how do we investigate that? That's uh, what we, we want to take that alert and drill down into the process and see what could it be. Is it known bad? Is it uh, un unknown bad? So here's an example of, uh, well, uh, something's not working right with this RTU. Well, we look in the configuration, some of the configurations that, uh, or, or you can o edit with Notepad. So, oh, we looked in the serial port settings. It was set for 2600 baud instead of 2400. So someone set the wrong baud rate. So that happens a lot. You, you have a lot of misconfigurations. Um, so that's a known bad. We, we have misconfigurations all the time, but you didn't know that until you did some investigation. Uh, Okay, so when do we escalate this to a security incident? You know, is it so unknown we've got to, uh, and it's not something, it's not like a misconfiguration. Something else is going on. Something's fishy. Something's uh, question. You have too many questions as, as an analyst. Who do we call? Who do we call? Do we call the engineers that know the system and, you know, you know all the way up to vendors and PR and safety? Here, here's another example. Well, oh, well. It was a squirrel in the substation. Okay, okay. So that's that's pretty normal. Well, what if it's this unknown thing? 
That's what we have to, you know, ask lots and lots of questions about to be prepared for that and your environment. Uh, whatever you do, um, don't turn off and on the uh, PLC if it's got problems. Um, you know, you, you're familiar with these. Uh, a lot of times the logs will just disappear, <laughs> right? Uh, and sometimes if you don't re react fast enough, uh, the logs will roll over. <laughs> so th there's a lot of interesting things. We want to preserve the logs and any digital forensics uh, evidence uh, the best as possible. So if there's a suspicious thing going on, you know, uh, Jason Larson writes a PLC rootkit, um, um, just as an example. Uh, um, you know, it, it's, you know, we know he's been in there and he's touched it. Uh, we don't want to reboot it. We want to find out what he's done. Um, so how do we do this collection? Well, we have to use the tools that the vendors give us and some other tools that are open source. So you use Terminal or TerraTerm or Putty. Um, you might use, in this example, uh, I'm going to cover two devices, uh, one from GE and one from Schweitzer. So we're going to use those uh, tools and, you know, a serial cable. Sometimes the only way you can get information is with a good old RS-232 console cable, right? So for embedded devices specifically, so I'm going to skip the HMI stuff. That's kind of more of, you know, Windows-based stuff that's been well covered in the industry. A lot of tools there. So what, what can we collect? Well, break it down into two things. You have physical data, and then you have digital data. Well, physical thing, we want to know when, what, what it is, what firmware, where it's at, uh, what are the LEDs. So whenever a, a, a something happened in a substation and I get a call, well, RT's down at so-and-so substation. Well, how do you know it's down? Well, it's not working. Well, okay. Tell me what the lights say on the front. Well, they're, they're blinking red. Okay, that's a bad sign. Uh, or if they're blinking green, well, there's something else going on. So a lot of the, the front panel LEDs tell you right there uh, what the problem could be. Uh, power consumption. Uh, uh, this one's really interesting. Uh, do you guys uh, know uh, uh, Mark Febro? Right? Uh, he had a story once. They found an HMI that was running hot. They noticed it with their FLIR camera. One HMI was running hotter than the other, and when they did some investigation, they found a Trojan had been installed, uh, I guess by USB, got infected, and there was a Trojan on that, on that HMI. So they found it by using temperature as <laughs> a camera. So, and also physical uh, access, so evidence of tampering. Did someone uh, break into uh, a place, uh, cut a fence, things like that. Digital data, you know, User accounts, running configuration, last known good. If there's like a USB or a CD up in the in the RTU cabinet, um, or in your central database, uh, running firmware, proof firmware. So sometimes we've had people upload rogue firmware before that they didn't they weren't being malicious. They just put the wrong firmware on there. Uh, a lot of these devices show their CPU usage percentage and also memory, and that's very helpful when we're doing collection running processes, and then a lot of those other things, logs, memory dumps, see, that's more advanced stuff that not every PLC can do. But we're starting to see that. How can we find evil or ways for evil to do evil? So that's you know, things that are misconfigured or not hardened, um, a, a feature that an attacker could use. Uh, first responders, uh, you're going you're gonna to rely on your control system engineers and your technicians. Because uh, they know those PLCs backwards and forwards generally, and they already know how to use those tools that they already use every day. So, what do the user and event logs reveal? You know, um, what what a, it, does the configuration match the firmware? Is it the same firmware that we had approved from the factory acceptance test? And these things can happen, uh, be analyzed pretty quickly when we do the analysis piece. Is the configuration and ladder logic correct? So, like in the case of INL, you know, you went in and changed the uh, Switzer uh, relay settings. Well, if you take a relay engineer and someone looks at the configuration and says, yeah, that's not right. Someone's not supposed to allow the breaker to, to sync at, uh, you know, 120 degrees out of phase. No, that's not normal. But you'd have to have that knowledge, and you have to find an engineer with that knowledge to, to know that. And so that might take a little more time as we go down the, the time uh, scale here. 
uh, are the communications uh, normal uh, compared to known goods? So you may have to do a packet capture serial or or network. Um, I've had to send folks out to substations to do serial packet captures before to find problems. And it takes a while to do that, so it takes a little bit more time. As we get into the operating system and, and any memory analysis, that's going to take even more time. That's why you see you know, people want to hear, oh, malware attack. Uh, and you want the news story, so I'm going to pick on Blake and uh, some of the other reporters. They want to get that news story out quick. Well, analysis takes a while. Um, it's not instantaneous. So the same thing, you've got to dig through all of the embedded operating system files that you can capture, any data at rest, data in transit, and and any volatile memory, if that's even possible, to look for uh, you know a potential rootkit. Uh, all that stuff takes time, and by the time you know some you know your CEO wants to do attribution, that's going to take a while. Even if it's, it, it may not even be possible. So let's do some DFI on two example substation RTUs. And this is just um, an example of two devices that I have. Your devices may be completely different, but this kind of methodology is what we want to start sharing and be uh, expecting as people do more research and write more uh, malicious stuff. It's starting to happen. Read the manual. <laughs> just like Apollo 11, uh, they really had manuals for everything. So the, these, uh, the first one is a GE D20MX. That's the newer version of the older D20. Uh, they have excellent manuals. Uh, it's a PowerQuick 2 Pro uh, processor, a gig of RAM. Um, they've got uh, VxWorks, real-time operating system on there. So uh, pretty popular. Uh, so a lot of these things I'm going to cover in this apply to your devices. So like Emerson, they have uh, VxWorks running on uh, your PLCs, uh, Dayfus. Um, so the tools to use here is you use the, the manual that comes with. So uh, it's not open source. Um, you might be able to find a copy of the manual in, you know, if you own these, hopefully. <laughs> the SG config software terminal like TerraTerm or Putty and then WinSCP. And they actually have a, a good guide in Chapter 11 on troubleshooting. So it talks about, hey, how to troubleshoot serial communications, firmware, mismatches, shell commands, and logs. All the perfect things that we want to collect uh, when we're doing digital forensics. Um, as an example, we looked at these three different manuals. Um, you know, This may not be interesting to you if you don't have these devices, but I'm just giving you this as an example. They have uh, the controller user manual on troubleshooting, it shows you how to use the shells. There's actually uh, three shells in this. Um, the two important logs, uh, anytime I had a, um, a RTU problem, I'd ask them to look at the error log and the user log. So the error log tells you anything that there's wrong error-wise in the configuration or if there's a warning. And they actually have documentation for every single error and warning in their manuals. Excellent resource. Um, also, the user log, it actually logs every keystroke in this device. And it gets put to a, a syslog. Perfect opportunity to start collecting syslog. If you have these, collect it. And, and you can see, um, it's kind of hard to see with this screen, but uh, you can get a copy of the presentation later. But you can see uh, who the user was logged in, and they typed... Uh, you know, w it shows VER. I, I typed VER in that, and it actually shows every keystroke that they that they type. It's really it's really great for forensics. So there's three shells. Um, there's one that belongs to the D20 uh, itself, and then there's two that uh, are part of VxWorks. So there's uh, the one that's the D20 shell is the most popular. Um, and the one that most people use. Um, if the, you go down the VxWorks level, you're getting into things that GE would ask you to do. So the, you might not have an expertise in that. Um, GE definitely will. And then the people that are familiar with VxWorks, well, this will apply to them as well. So if you've seen that movie, <laughs> he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's like, gosh. Um, and so in the, in the main shell, um, there's all the, this is a help print out so you can see all the different commands we can see um, basically all the things that we would if we're doing collecting data also attackers might want to use this shell too because uh, you can actually write to memory if you are connected serially uh, so you know that's perfect for 
attackers and defenders. And I'm obviously a defender here, so we want to be able to see what commands we have. We can, um, we're going to go over some of these shells. But like, for instance, an IFINF shows the IP information. So you can look at the IP address and whatnot. So when we connect to this, um, it's a very common task. We can look at the running configuration. We can get the last known good configuration. Like I said, it might be in a USB drive on the cabinet, you know, whatever, however everybody does it. You type IMG, run, find the running firmware, query RAM. Uh, you can, uh, my, my slides uh, uh, shifted there, but the last one is uh, query processes, so you can see the PIDs. So you can s uh, see what applications are running. It's really great. Um, serial analyzer. So this is a, a serial analyzer. Um, before we had Wireshark, we used this. And you can look. This is an example of DMP3 traffic going between the master station and the D20's response. So I had to do this a lot. And, and a lot of your folks that may have to do this already. So this is very uh, common to do. So for finding, uh, especially uh, finding uh, uh, misconfigurations. You can look at system information. And also, you can dump memory with this. And so, dumping a gig of RAM um, is possible in the VXWorks. Now, let's talk about the C shell real quick and the command shell. Uh, C shell is just another smaller shell in VXWorks. And then you can drill down into the command shell, which gives you netstat, IP firewall, syslog, show devices, show driver, show history, ifconfig, uh, which is, you know, the the, the uh, uh, network interfaces, route, and a, you can even do a PCAP. So it even in the manual, it tells you how to store a PCAP on the PLC if you can't put in a tap yourself. So that's perfect uh, uh, use there. Okay, so well, let's think negatively now. So Josh would be talking here, and let's, let's inject memory in with the command M in the sh uh, VxWorks shell. So we can say M, and we can write dead beef into just a random place in memory. We did that. And we collect volatile memory using the dump memory command D in the right. And you can see it says dead beef. So in live memory, we can write and uh, read stuff. Uh, in the D20, uh, whoops, um, you, in the D20, you can only, uh, they have smart about it, they've only allowed you to do that over the console port. So you can't do it over SSH. So you have physically have to be there, which is a great thing. That, uh, no remote dumping or no, no remote uh, modifying memory. So here's the problem. We need tools that enable us to form DFR on ICS and embedded devices. So the, here's the solution. Now Josh is not here, but he wrote a tool that allows you to read memory from VxWorks and write to it if, if needed to. Uh, cache the live memory locally. Um, also compare the system image to other images so you can take multiple images over time and compare them. And it's all done in Python so you can uh, have Python objects that fetch and cache memory as needed. So uh, whatever tools in the future. Some of the features, it can do it over serial, TCP, um, and protocols specific to other t dumping utilities. Um, actually a little pre-work before this. Um, um, uh, HD Moore did a, a, a tool in uh, Metasploit to dump VxWorks memory. Well, this does as well. He actually hooked up to a Raspberry Pi in my house <laughs> and connected to it over the internet and was able to dump the memory. Uh, it does caching, so if connectivity is lost, uh, it'll resume uh, where it left off, which is great. And it works on um, anything that has a SQLable Python file object. So cache files, memory dumps, sparse memory maps, special objects. So we can v validate the host image here. Um, so what we did was, uh, it's kind of hard to see on this screen, but there's a IP firewall start in VxWorks. And we wrote a zero at the beginning of that to make it stop. So when we did the comparison, uh, let's see here. Um, when we did the comparison, between the known good where the IP firewall is supposed to work and then we did another memory dump where we put a zero, we have a mismatch here. So we can tell the difference uh, in VxWorks uh, that someone fooled with the memory. 
cool project. So use CLE loads everything. So that's a Python script if you're familiar with that. I'm not an expert in Python. And uh, very, very uh, excellent. It's supposed to be supporting ELF now. So we've got to add that to the tool. Um, and then use the pro project called Capstone. So basically ripping the uh, uh, files apart for disassemble, uh, disassembly. Um, plans for the future. We are uh, moving the code to GitHub, and we're going to be releasing that as soon as legally possible. We're, the, the people that are taking the class this Friday, you'll get a copy of this tool. And as soon as we can get um, it done, we're going to put it on GitHub, and everybody will be able to download it and make changes to it and whatnot. Now let's talk about another device quickly. Um, we have a Switcher 3530 RTAC. It's another RTU that's used in substations, um, mostly in the US. Um, it's a power PC. It uses, um, it also has a gig RAM. It uses uh, Switcher's version of embedded Linux. And they've got great manuals uh, as well. So you're going to use the instruction manual, their software, web browser. And uh, that's really only the tools that we can use. Uh, for this. So how do we collect the two uh, types of data? So we have digital data. It, it gives us on the web page, gives us the running firmware, what user accounts, CPU usage, memory usage, post checks. And uh, there's also a password jumper physical on these uh, units. All Switcher relays tend to have a password jumper in case of uh, emergencies. So you can, it's hard to see, but right here it says password jumper is uh, currently disabled. So you can see that remotely uh, if it's uh, someone's tampered with anything. So here's an example from Project Robust, uh, and this is a live screenshot. Whenever I sent a malicious DMP3, you know, it uh, took up all the CPU usage 100%, and it took up all the RAM eventually. And then we get an error that says our attack has failed. Can you hear me? And when it rebooted, you can see the CPU usage is back down to normal, but it says project failed, uh, running failover project. So just uh, e just using that uh, web screen shows you some interesting things. If you come in and see your, whoops, um, if you come in and see your CPU usage is pegged around 100%, that's not a good thing. So you have to do some inve investigation about that. There's also uh, sections in the manual on testing and troubleshooting, same as before, web HMI and logging and security. Uh, it also has syslog, so if you have these devices, turn on syslog and start collecting it centrally. Um, and you can see on the uh, which ports are assigned and which ports are active, which is great. Um, they also have an ability to, uh, in the database, um, you can, when you do the, the system tags, you can um, assign more forensics type of uh, points that be can, can be collected and uh, also be sent to syslog. It's gr really great. There's no Linux shell, so I have to uh, cry about that. Um, uh, so it, it's also a pro because hackers can't get, you know, evil hackers from, you know, Elbonia can't uh, get into <laughs> in, into your, uh, and there's no shell to get access to, so they have to find another way to attack the device. Uh, there is no SSH interface for it. It's only used for pass-through to relays behind it. Um, it can also do serial packet capture and uh, Wireshark. Uh, they wrote some, uh, even some serial uh, Wireshark uh, parsers for Switcher fast messaging and Telegear 8979 protocol. So it does uh, a network and serial packet captures. It's really great. Uh, for further reading, uh, we've got H.D. Moore's blog post on VxWorks from 2010, and he has that uh, Metasploit module for VxWorks. Um, David Ogdell's post on Qnix from 2012. So Qnix is another real-time operating system that's very popular. Um, hopefully, we can get some people writing some tools for Qnix as well. Uh, we might be even take, able to take a crack at it. I know um, Radix, uh, that project is out, and you know it, it's probably going to take four years for that to get done. So, but we can do this now. We, I think we can do it now and do it open source as well. ICS Cert has recommended practices for ICS Forensics well. They have a, a white paper about it. Uh, Travis Goodspeed, brilliant guy. He knows a lot about embedded systems, so he's got some really great embedded device work with MSP430 processor family. Uh, really great uh, 
uh, tools and other processes you can use to do digital forensics. Ralph Lagner, obviously, for Stuxnet. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, work on uh, the forensics there with uh, Stuxnet. And then the you know, what uh, SANS ICS team did with the Ukraine um, defense use case uh, five from uh, last year that they published uh, shows that you know the firmware that was written over for the Ethernet serial converters that that uh, involves embedded devices, so that's something to consider. Uh, we've got about five minutes uh, for questions. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience. I'd like you to state your name and organization you're with. Uh, Marina Kratofil, uh, Honeywell Industrial Cybersecurity Lab. So I would like to hear your opinion, especially uh, now when you've got experiences. So there is a problem. So. Uh, plant floor is a zoo, so forensics uh, does not scale. So basically every device has absolutely different logs, need different instruments, approach, and so on. So it does not scale neither for the defenders nor for offenders. Mm -hmm. And when I, you've been talking especially like, yeah, open the manual, because I've heard stories when certain investigations of the attacks that they actually the adversary get into your network and start reading manuals. That's right. Mm -hmm. The point is, how do you find, what is your recommendation for the vendors and the, for us as a community? Uh, where do we find this trade-off between may, uh, having like, you know, like everything unified? Like, can we develop like recommendation for the vendors? Mm, please include those logs, use those tools. Because you see, it's easier for us, but we also make this task easier for the attackers because they know what to wipe exactly and sure. so on. So where does this find this balance? What is your opinion? Well, I, I think it starts with uh, awareness because if the vendors are aware that people have the ability to write rootkits and things like that, that that are getting into memory now, uh, they'll probably want to consider ways to, you know, you're, a vendor, you're at a vendor. So hopefully you can take that back to the teams that with that and the, uh, others too. take it back to your vendors and say, hey, if this happened, what do we do? Um, I think there's ways to do it. Like you said, there's so many different devices and so many different things. Focus on the ones like, so we focused on VxWorks. A very popular operating system. Focus on Qunix. You might be able to focus on the operating system, underlying operating system first. And, and if there's anything specific, recommendations for each PLC type. Uh, if you you know you want to get the major uh, coverage for your most critical assets first, um, you know, make sure those are covered because uh, you know it. It's just something that's kind of bleeding edge, I think, and we need to start thinking about it. So, and, and two, uh, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but it's true. You may not be able to trust the things that you, you collect because uh, an attacker may uh, turn on things in memory and, and then make sure that the serial port goes back to normal and blah, 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 and hide their tracks and may infect the software like SG config. They may be able to infect that or a lot of things. So there's a, there's a caveat I forgot to mention. Uh, you know, you may not be able to trust the things that you collect. may not be good. But, it, you know, for instance, in the D20, it takes um, five days to collect um, the whole memory dump because it's a gig over 115, 200 baud <laughs> serially. So um, y your data may change in that fo those five days if you do a whole dump in one fell swoop. And any other questions? Yeah, uh, not one here. Uh, Lars, uh, Norwegian Energy Sector Search. Um, we are talking about how is it, it is now, but what about the central logging for also for industrial control systems? And the vendors have to look forward and how to get the engineering capabilities out to central log. So um, the things you are talking about now is not a longer um, a problem. That's right. Um, you know, the centralized logging is very important. It kind of dovetails into network security monitoring as a larger practice because it would be great. Wouldn't it be great to not only collect logs um, from, you know, like syslog, but also look at your SCADA and control system logs and look at the timestamps. Can you correlate if a power outage happens and an intrusion? You know, that's just an example. You, you want to be able to, you know, you have say a, a smart grid which is on top of your power grid and right now the, the logs are kind of separate 
well, why don't we start collecting centrally and, and correlate those things? And, you know, you got all these different processes, oil and gas, all these others that we can do the same thing with. But collect your log centrally. A lot of these newer devices have syslog. I, I don't see an excuse why you shouldn't be collecting them now. There's so many tools out there and so many vendors now that would do network security monitoring for control systems. So you don't have an excuse anymore. All right, any other questions for Chris? So the kind of logs that you will collect, would they be helpful in DFIR? Because the syslog is probably not going to go very deep. Yeah, so, it, yeah, again, it's, you know, syslog, um, but I don't know if this answers your question. There's also sometimes very specific logs that are for each type of PLC that may not be called anything but a, a just a you know, PLC log or, you know, um, you know, Rockwell, you know, factory talk log or something like that. Um, collecting those, um, all the types, if possible, uh, uh, is a good thing. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay. All right, any other questions? Uh, with, uh, with all the failures for mis misconfigurations and, and just random everyday uh, issues, how, how do you differentiate between something that needs uh, a forensics approach versus day-to-day -day troubleshooting? Okay, um, th that kind of goes in with your visibility too. Uh, misconfigurations, if uh, usually the device will stop talking. And then if you know someone's out there working on the device, uh, you might be able to put that together pretty quickly. Uh, you know, especially if you could do some correlation between um, a user login or like a door alarm or something like that. You'd be able to correlate those events pretty quickly. But, yeah, you know, someone who has uh, on the ground first hand knowledge of what's going on, they, they'll probably, oh, yeah. Uh, by the t when I was in the power company, I, had, I was the top tier. So it, four states, and then by the time it got to me, someone's on fire. So <laughs> it's one of those things where you have to have a tiered approach, too. Uh, you, hopefully the engineers and the technicians at the lower level can quickly determine if it's a misconfiguration or not. Mm -hmm.